Today I am thrilled to bring you a compilation of some of my tried and true number one top performing bread recipes in my house. This is quick breads, muffins, yeast breads, rolls, cinnamon rolls, desserts, maybe of the pumpkin persuasion. You cannot go wrong with these recipes coming at you. So if you love cooking videos, hook me up with a thumbs up and let's get cooking. I have half of my flour in here, a cup and a half of quick oats, one tablespoon of salt, a quarter cup of dry milk powder. I'm also adding water, so this could just be milk later. My brown sugar and yeast are in, so here comes some melted butter, some warm water, and then we'll let the machine do all the work. After having the machine knead it, letting it rise, and cooking it in the oven, this is what you have, the completed oatmeal bread. And I get asked about these bread pans all the time. They're just from Ikea, you guys, these long skinny bread pans. They're the same size as the normal ones. If you don't have an Ikea, you can't get there. They're super cheap there. I'll try and find some on Amazon and link those below if you want to check it out. And I personally love topping it with some melted butter. I've been making this exact recipe for 15 years. It's a winner. You cannot go wrong. Look at the texture of this bread. It, oh my gosh, it is so worth it. All I have is a pot of water boiling on the stove because this bread is actually going to rise in the oven with a pot of boiling water, which makes a really humid, warm environment. I am using just all purpose white flour and a tiny bit of whole wheat flour just because I wanna use it up. It's like the end of this barrel. So two and a half cups of warm water, two tablespoons of the yeast right in there in the water, three tablespoons of white sugar, two tablespoons of white vinegar. I know, right? You're thinking weird, but vinegar is actually a tenderizer. I use it in my pie crust as well. It just makes the texture so so soft and yummy. Two tablespoons of white vinegar. Let's let this hang out for about five minutes, kind of to proof the yeast a little bit, and we'll be right back. I'm a little bubbly now, so I'm gonna add the rest of the ingredients, which is oil, salt, and my flour. I have one third of a cup of oil, one tablespoon of salt, and this regular cheapy table salt. I know it looks like a lot, but it is two full loaves of bread. And six to seven cups of flour. Now, if you've seen my other bread recipes, you'll know, because I've already said this, but flour is temperamental and it's not so much about like, oh, it's six cups of flour or seven cups of flour. It's more about what the texture of the dough looks and feels like. Because if you live in a humid climate or a dry climate, or if it's raining outside, it's gonna look different than on another day when it's not raining outside or someone in a wetter climate or whatever. So that's about one and a quarter and my whole wheat flour is gone. If you're gonna use more whole wheat flour, I would probably add vital wheat gluten, which um, wheat flour has a harder time developing the gluten that your bread needs for that really soft texture. So that's like two cups. I'm gonna start with five and start mixing and just kind of see what it looks like. Now mine is still sticking to the sides of the bowl. That's kind of what I'm looking for, for it to clean the sides of the bowl completely. So I'm gonna add I'm gonna go with a half a cup right now and mix it again and just kind of see what it looks like. Okay, mine just cleaned the sides of the bowl completely, so I'm gonna let this run for about 10 minutes just to knead it. And then we're gonna dump, then we'll dump it into our bowl and stick it in the oven with our water to rise. Once it's done kneading, I have a large glass bowl and put some oil in there for the rising process, and this is gonna be slightly sticky. This should rise quite a bit. This bread is very floofy. Now, this is the part where you're gonna have to be patient and wait for quite a while because you want it to rise and you're gonna punch it down two to five times, depending on how much time you have to work with. Two at an absolute minimum and five if you have a lot of time. Like the rise and the punch down and the rise and the punch down is gonna give you really beautiful texture. And this French bread is unique in the fact that it's fairly soft, whereas if you would go to the store, the, the crust is slightly harder, if that makes sense. Give that a little flip so it's coated in oil all the way. I will top it with a clean kitchen towel like this, and it's gonna go into the oven with my little pot of boiling water. It doesn't have to be big. Here's mine right here, if you can see the steam. Can you? I can see it. It was boiling until I just pulled it off the stove. So this and this both in the oven and turn on your oven light. It'll rise quicker. So you want it to double. You're gonna punch it down. It's gonna double, punch it down. That's at least two, okay? Punching it down for the first time. You can see how big it got. Okay, 
Okay. Put that back on and back into the oven. I ended up letting mine rise and punched it back down about four times or so. But like I said before, you only have to do it twice. I have two sheet pans out here with some parchment paper and cornmeal so it doesn't stick. Technically, you don't need the cornmeal if you're using the parchment, but uh, I like to double it up. So this is a kneading technique if you've never kneaded your own bread and don't have a mixer and wanna try it out. So you just gather it and then push it away from you with the heel of your hand. So if you're gonna knead it by hand, I would do that for about uh, 10, eight to 10 minutes or something like that. I'm just shaping my bread into like French bread loaf kind of shapes and slicing the top a couple of times with my little dough scraper. And my first one was a little shorter and wider and my second one was longer and skinnier, mostly because I just wanted to see how they would cook with the slightly different shapes. Uh, we preferred the longer and skinnier one, but they both cooked beautifully. And once you're done making your dough shapes, you're going to cover them with a, your clean towel that you've used before, let it rise for another 20 or 30 minutes until it doubles, and then bake it in the oven for approximately 30 minutes at 375 degrees Fahrenheit. I put my oven on convection because I have the two loaves in there, but if you don't have a convection oven, you're gonna wanna rotate them and switch them around just to make sure that everything is cooking evenly. Okay, right, here are my two loaves of bread. I've let these sit for maybe 15 minutes out of the oven so they are cool enough to hold and handle and we can slice them now. And the kids are already lining up to have some. <laughs> yes, we are. Here's the texture of the bread. How beautiful that is, all the holes that are in there. So I'm gonna start with five cups of hot water. If it's too hot, it's gonna kill your yeast. So if you stick your finger in there and you can leave it in there because it feels really warm, but it's not burning you, that's the right temperature. Next up is a half a cup of sugar to give the yeast something to munch on and four tablespoons or a quarter cup of yeast. Just kind of let this sit for five to 10 minutes until it gets all bubbly and yeasty smelling. Okay, it looks like I got a little distracted and I walked away for too long. This is very, very bubbly, but this is kind of what you're looking for. All right, next up, we're gonna throw in about five cups of flour. We are gonna need more flour than that, but I like to start with maybe half of what the recipe calls for. And I am using this King Arthur bread flour today. Five-ish. Four teaspoons of salt. I know that sounds like a ton, but remember this is four loaves of bread. And a quarter cup of oil or butter or whatever. This is coconut oil right here. And start mixing. So we're gonna take this out and put it in a greased mixing bowl. I have a, I have a 13 quart mixing bowl that I like to put this in and it's gonna do its first rise. So I know it's gonna feel too sticky. The first time I showed my mom this method, she was like, this, this dough's too sticky, it's not gonna work. And I was like, mom, trust me, it'll work. Because it just has a different texture when you make it in a mixer like this. I think it's probably gonna come across as a little sticky, plus I have gloves on, but let's get this out of here. So I just have some vegetable oil in this. Now that it's in there, I just wanna roll it over once, like something like that, so it's all coated in the oil. And now we will put a clean kitchen towel over this and let it rise for 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, depending on how warm your kitchen is.
I creamed the butter and sugar together forever. Look how light and fluffy this is. Then I did the eggs one at a time. Please make sure you turn off your mixer before you add eggs because let me tell you what, crunchy, <laughs> crunchy bread, crunchy cheesecake. Yeah, it's not really the best. So I've got my eggs going in one at a time. I feel like the mixing process of this took so long to do. And there is my sweetened condensed milk that went in there. Oh yeah, by the way, if you're new, I don't measure my vanilla like ever. I just don't think it's necessary. If a little bit of vanilla is good, more vanilla has to be better. So here's what I'll say about pound cake. I don't know if you guys are fans of pound cake or not, but I'm generally not a pound cake lover. It's too, I don't know, dense, wet, not sweet enough, um, too rich for me. I don't know. I don't really jive towards really, really high fat foods and desserts in general. They're just too much for me. But Dave loves pound cake. So I thought he would really enjoy this. And this does have a lemon glaze that goes on top. Here is my completed pound cake and here is my lemon glaze. It's just fresh lemon juice and powdered sugar. Spread that all over the top and let it kind of soak in. I pulled it out of the pan, sliced it up um, and put it on a pretty plate. Sorry to interrupt the cooking fun, but I did want to let you know that if you're interested in any of today's recipes in this video, I do have a PDF, a little mini e-cookbook if you would like to purchase it for just a couple dollars. The link for that will be down below in the description box. Let's get back to cooking. On. I have all of my wheat ground into flour and now we're gonna start the bread making process. So I ended up with one, two, three large containers of flour. I'm only gonna need about half of this to make my bread today. I need approximately 12 cups, 12 to 14 cups. I'm starting with six cups of water. Remember I'm doing four loaves of bread and you just wanna make sure it's warm to the touch but doesn't burn your hand. And that's the right temperature. Two thirds cup of oil. I just have a vegetable oil. Two thirds cup of honey. You can use brown sugar if you want. I just really like honey with whole wheat. I think it tastes really good. And three tablespoons of yeast. Yes, I know it's a lot of yeast, but it's gonna be a lot of bread. Our five minutes are up and it's nice and foamy, so we're gonna add the rest of our ingredients and there's really only three left. So salt, no, I'm not, <laughs> not gonna use a cup of salt. Salt. I like to use vital wheat gluten when I make whole wheat bread because it makes the texture really, really soft. This is not necessary, but if you find your texture to be quite coarse, this is a dough conditioner. Uh, it helps the proteins develop a little bit better. So we're gonna go six cups of flour to start to three. And are you even cooking with me if you don't fling flour all over? Four, six. Now my Bosch is actually fairly full right now, but I guarantee you it'll all fit. I've done this many, many times. I've got two tablespoons of salt. Remember it's four loaves of bread. So it's actually not that much. And I'm gonna go a half a cup gluten. So we're gonna mix it just a minute. See how wet it is. Super wet, really, really wet. Okay, I'm gonna go another two cups of flour. So that'll put me at eight cups of flour. And we'll mix again. Okay, definitely very, very wet. It kind of looks like wet concrete a little bit. And now's the time that I'm just gonna let it sit for 10 minutes so my flour, my coarse flour can soak up as much moisture as possible. I'll use significantly less flour this way. So 10 minutes, I'm coming right back. Here at the top of my bowl. That way I know it has soaked up as much as it can and it's time to add the remaining flour so I can get it to knead correctly and turn it into bread dough. So I turned my Bosch onto number one, which is the low knead speed. And it's already starting to clean the size of the bowl, so I know I'm not gonna need to add a ton more flour. Two to four cups is what I'm guessing. And you just watch it until it cleans the sides of the bowl and then let it knead for eight to 10 minutes. Okay. Drizzle a little oil at the bottom of that and put some oil on my hands for the transfer process. Even if it's a little sticky now, that's okay because after this first rise, it will be way less sticky. This is a 13 quart 
mixing bowl, so it's really, really big. Um, and I'm just gonna coat this with the oil. Okay, I've got a clean kitchen towel. I'm just gonna cover this, and it's gonna rise for, I don't know, 30 to 40 minutes. It really depends on how warm your house is. So before I get my hands messy, I'm going to spray all of my loaf pans so they're ready to go. <laughs> ready for it? Oh, look how big it is. It's big. So I'm gonna use oil as, like instead of flour, on the counter and on my hands to keep everything moist. Just like get it out, you know what I'm saying? I wiped my counter before we started. Don't you worry. And now there's no turning back. <laughs> so I have oil all over my hands, so I hope I don't. Am I recording? Okay, good. Because I'm not touching the camera anytime soon. Now, this recipe I used to make without doing that first rise in the, in the bowl. I used to just put it straight into the loaf pans, which you can do, but your texture is gonna be so much better this way. So while I form these into loaf size uh, blobs of dough, like there's nothing special. I'm just kind of like rolling it into an oblong-ish shape like that. So we're gonna do five loaves today, rise for the second time, and then we will bake. My timer just beeped for my bread, so let's get it out. Oh, it's so beautiful. First thing I like to do is kind of rub some butter on it. A little kitchen hack for you. Don't rip the paper. <laughs> Even though I'm going to slice a slice right now so I can show you the texture of the inside, don't slice it this soon after you take it out. You'll regret it. So do as I say and not as I do. Look at the steam, can you see the steam? So that's the texture. It's super soft, very consistent holes on the inside. Basically, we've got two tablespoons of yeast, two cups of warm water, let it hang out for a bit, and then add a third of a cup of sugar, third of a cup of melted butter, one egg, or you can sub the egg for a half a cup of mashed potatoes, which I do often, two and a half teaspoons of salt, two thirds cup of dry milk powder, and about five to six cups of flour or so. I like to do this in my Bosch because First of all, the Bosch can handle a lot, so I can double it, triple it, and no big deal. And then I know when it's done, when it cleans the sides of the bowl, just like this. I dump it into an oiled bowl and cover it with a like clean tea towel or something, kitchen towel, until it has risen double. So after they're done rising, put them on a sprayed baking sheet. I do about, I think about 20 rolls. Once you're done with that, cover them with the tea towel again, let them rise again. These are seriously like the best rolls on the planet earth mashed potato in place of the egg i don't know what it does but it's like oh my gosh it's so delicious and then of course once it's done rising go ahead and pop it into the oven 375 degrees fahrenheit for about 20 minutes you'll know when they're done they look like this grab a ziploc bag shove in the amount of rolls you would like to freeze and then stick them in the freezer two loaves here this is not a diet bread this is just the most amazing banana bread you will ever try in your life. I realize that's a bold statement, but I'm very confident about this recipe. So I have two sticks of butter in here, two cups of just plain white sugar, and cream until nice and fluffy and delicious. Ah! To which I will add four eggs. And every time I've done a double-handed crack, the last couple days I've cracked a shell in there. Please no shell. No shell. <laughs> Yeah, don't bother measuring your vanilla. No need for that business. Just put it in until it looks good. And until it tastes good. Next up is some flour. I have never made this recipe with a flour alternative, so I'm not sure how that would work. I would imagine it would be a little more dry, so perhaps less flour. But the standard recipe calls for four cups of flour, so we'll add that in right now. One teaspoon of salt. There we go two teaspoons of baking powder. And I usually make two loaves at a time instead of one, because I figure if I'm gonna make a mess and go for it anyway, I mean, I have six people that I'm feeding in my family and a lot of hungry teenagers right now. I figure just like, like make it, like go big or go home, right? If I'm gonna make one, might as well make two. If I'm gonna make two, might as well make four. Where does it end? I don't know. Okay, that just stirs for a minute and then all of your nanas. Now, if they're super, super soft, so this is my ripe one and then the rest were previously frozen. If they're really soft, you don't have to pre-mash them. Your beaters will kind of mush them up for you anyway. So I kind of don't really do that anymore. I just throw it in. So this recipe does call for six bananas. 
and the pre-frozen ones really turn into like banana juice almost. So you just kind of squeeze them. <laughs> they look a little weird. <laughs> squeeze them out of their skins right in there. Okay, let's mix this until it is all combined. I typically don't add nuts to mine because my youngest son, Ryan, really hates the texture of nuts in stuff. So I tend to leave them out unless they are pureed really, really small. As far as adding chocolate chips, I personally, in my opinion, feels like it takes away from the sweetness of the banana bread. But I did have a couple of people ask me to add some chocolate chips today. So I think what I'm gonna do is do one loaf sans chocolate chips and one loaf with a couple chocolate chips. Squeeze the bottle and poof. There's one, the plain one. And now we'll add a few ingredients to the fancy one. These are some pureed almonds. So I will put nuts in one of these. Here are my two loaves of banana bread into a 350 degree oven for about 45 to 60 minutes, depending on your oven. The banana muffin recipe starts with egg, milk, and oil and mashed banana. Mashed banana. Up, stir all that together. One egg. Okay, one third of a cup of milk, half a cup of oil, and your mashed bananas. And if your bananas aren't quite soft, you can use a pastry blender to mush these up. I think that's a really good way to start it. Two cups of flour. Mm-hmm. Two thirds of a cup of brown sugar. We're gonna go one tablespoon of baking powder. Yeah, that's gonna make them nice and fluffy and one tisp of salt. Don't mix for too long, you don't wanna make it tough. Now if I remember right, this muffin recipe only makes 12, so if you're smarter than me, you would double it. <laughs> 400 degree oven for 15 to 20 minutes. Here are the muffins. How beautiful are these? Basically, you're gonna mix warm water, sugar, oil, and yeast in your mixer of choice. Anyway, you let the yeast stuff sit for like 15 minutes or so, and then you add the salt, the eggs and the flour. Because you add so much yeast, you can see it like bubbling up like crazy right here. This rises very, very quickly. So after you mix this all up, wow, that's a lot of flour. Kind of looks like it's gonna explode, doesn't it? Holy moly. Yeah, the Bosch is so awesome. It can hold easily like 15 cups of flour. It's fantastic. So kind of the same story as the rolls. You just mix it up until it pulls away from the bowl and then let it, I just let it sit in the Bosch. And so while that was rising, it doesn't take very long. I mixed up the cinnamon and sugar for the filling, a little bit of melted butter, about a half a cup or so, maybe a little bit more if you like it super buttery, which I do. Take your big ball of dough and you're gonna divide it into, and then do your standard cinnamon roll mush, right? I, I don't use a rolling pin for this. I just use my hands and, and mush it out into like a square. Add about half the butter or so, and then your cinnamon sugar mixture, or if you, know, if you wanna do orange rolls, this is where you would be adding the orange. So roll this up as tight as you can. I like to go away from me. I feel like I can go tighter. Your hands will get messy here. So just put on an apron, you know, start with clean hands and just accept the fact that you're gonna be messy. And if you have a helper, that would be really, really good. So my tip as far as cutting cinnamon rolls is to do it with dental floss. You can do this uh, cool little swipe like this. It just cuts it so nicely. A knife will mush it a little and then put them in the pans you would like to cook them in. I have never frozen these, but my friend Heather freezes them all the time. And so I was taking her advice on this and I learned a few things along the way. I was putting them in this these throwaway freezer tins because I just thought they would be really easy to like bake them in there, stick them in the freezer, done and done. But what I learned is they don't cook evenly in like foil things. So go ahead and cook them in the cookie sheet like you would normally. Yes, you do want to cook these before you freeze them. Go ahead and cook them, let them cool completely, completely, and then stack them in your foil thing. Cover them with saran wrap and then foil when, you know, Christmas morning or whatever, get them out the night before so they thaw completely, put them in the oven, with foil only on the top at 350, warm them for 10 minutes, and then go ahead and top them with your favorite cream cheese frosting. Please do the cream cheese frosting. It's so much better than the glaze. Don't you think like the cream cheese frosting just takes these over the top. So I highly recommend doing that. These are bomb and you don't even have to like cook them all the way through. Just thaw them and rewarm them in the oven. I'm telling you, they're gonna work perfectly. So I have three sticks of butter, softened butter in here. I'm gonna put this in my Bosch mixer. I would not try this quantity in a KitchenAid, but if you just wanna do a single batch, which is going to be the recipe I leave below, feel free to use that or a hand mixer would also work. And brown sugar. Now don't be scared, I'm tripling this. Oh yeah, we're talking three cups of sugar 
Next up we have three eggs. And we're gonna use some sour milk, but I don't have any milk. So I'm using water and powdered milk. Basically, you're just gonna use regular milk and add some lemon juice or vinegar to make it kind of sour, and you're good to go. One and a half tisp of vanilla. Yes. Now for all the dry ingredients. Six and three quarters cup. I'm gonna start with six and just kind of see how dry it is. One, one tablespoon of baking soda, half of that of baking powder, one tablespoon of cinnamon. Now I will mix that and just kind of see the consistency of the muffin. It can lean dry if your whole wheat flour has been like packed down. That looks like a really nice consistency actually. So I don't think I'm gonna add the last half a cup to three quarters of a cup of flour because mine must have been just packed down a little bit. I am baking at 350 degrees for approximately 20 minutes because I'm doing the giant muffin tins. So you guys haven't moved to the giant muffin tins. If you do bulk cooking, like you feeding a large family, you should try it. They're the equivalent of two small ones and I feel like these are way easier to clean and there's less holes to clean as well. Here are my whole wheat muffins. I'm gonna scoop these out and put them in a Tupperware and continue to cook the rest of this batter and then my muffins will be finished. I've been using this bis biscuit recipe for maybe 10 years or so and it is delicious. I typically make it with butter, but I used the shortening and honestly, guys, it came out just the same. So it's a money saving little hack for you to use shortening instead of butter. It's really easy to make. This is why I bought the buttermilk because it makes the best biscuits, 40 biscuits. And if you take nothing else from this video at all, get this biscuit recipe and incorporate it into your arsenal. What I like about these is you can add extra water after you kind of mix it up if it's feeling too dry. And it was for me, I live in a dry climate anyway, so it did need a little bit extra. And then as you start folding it together, all of the crumblies will start to come together. This is so easy to make. It bakes in 15 minutes. There's no rising time or anything. And I went ahead and just cut it into like little squares with this dough cutter. And I've heard you can pick these up at the Dollar Tree for a buck. So if you want to get yourself one of those, I think it's a nice little addition to your kitchen. You can use this for anything, breakfast, dinner, lunch. I love homemade biscuits. I separated four eggs, so I have my egg whites here. I'm gonna whip these up to get a meringue going. So set those to the side, and I have a wet ingredient and a dry ingredient situation. One cup of cornmeal, blop. Two cups of flour, one and two. One teaspoon of the baking powder. A half a teaspoon of salt. I just have plain old, plain old salt. That's almost gone. A cup and a half of sugar. Yes, a cup and a half. I told you it was delicious. Just using cane sugar here, cup and a half. Whisk it vigorously. Set that to the side. In my wet bowl, I have my four egg yolks to which I will add one cup of milk, one teaspoon of vanilla measured with your heart, 12 tablespoons of melted butter and they've kind of cooled so they're not gonna cook up my egg yolks. And we'll whisk that together. I will add my wet ingredients to my dry ingredients. Here we go. And mix until combined. Now we're gonna add our egg whites that I beat with a hand mixer until they were big and fluffy. Fold in the egg whites with trying not to like mush them up. I like to do half and then half again so we don't deflate all that air. That is what we're looking for. Look how beautiful it is. So I'm gonna bake this at 350 degrees for 30 minutes and I'm gonna do one foil pan that I'm gonna take to the family and then one eight by eight or nine by nine pan that we're gonna keep here. Make sure you spray these. Hopefully I can divvy these out equally. <laughs> Corn cake is complete when it's like firmish to the touch. The only thing that would make that better is a little bit of melted butter on top. Damn, that's good. Go make it. Just do it. One cup of softened butter, to which I will add. So I have one cup of granulated sugar. I am using cane sugar because I'm about trying to use this guy up. And a half a cup of packed brown sugar, pack brown sugar, cream those together. And when you're creaming butter and sugars together, you cannot over mix it. The longer it goes, the more air that gets whipped into it and the fluffier or more delicious it ends up being. So let her rip. Here is our batter and we'll add two more, well, maybe three more ingredients. One cup of pureed pumpkin 
not pumpkin pie filling, two tablespoons of water just to thin it out, some vanilla, and I mean, you can measure this if you wanna act like a caveman, but I figured that's about it. And mix one more time. Looks orange and smells like baby food, so it's time to add the flour, and I know what you're thinking. Where the heck are the eggs? Well, that's because there are no eggs in this. Can you believe it? No eggs in this. Two and a half cups of flour, I'm just using regular all-purpose flour. I would assume if you use the one-to-one -one flour from, I think it's Bob's Red Mill, that it would turn out similar. Two and a half teaspoons of cinnamon. If they're slightly heaping, that's probably fine because cinnamon is amazing. One teaspoon of cream of tartar. You know, you buy this and it just sits around and you wonder why the heck you have it. This is why you have it. This and snickerdoodles. One teaspoon of that. Half a teaspoon of baking powder. Half a teaspoon of baking soda. Those are different things, by the way, in case you didn't know. Quarter teaspoon of salt. Bloop. And quarter teaspoon each of nutmeg and all spice. Let's mix all this up and pour it in our baking pan. I have a nine by 13 metal baking dish with some parchment paper and I did grease it. If you're using a metal pan, it's gonna be 350 degrees in your oven. If you wanna use a glass pan, I'd take it down to 325. Don't put it in the oven yet. I have some cinnamon sugar mixture. We're supposed to sprinkle this on top. Can't believe I almost forgot the streusel topping. I mean, it's not really streusel. It's kind of like cinnamon toast topping, but you know, this gets sprinkled on top of this. And then it goes into the oven. Okay, now we'll bake it for 20 to 25 minutes. Little tip for me to you is when you make these, you do need to let them cool in the pan until they're almost completely cool. Because there's no eggs, they don't solidify as much as they would if there was eggs in it, which means once it's cooled, it's delectably moist and decadent. But it also means if you pull it out when it's hot, it's going to crumble into itty bitty bits and then you're gonna be frustrated. But anyway, here are the bars. Of course, we have to do a little taste test. I have the corner piece here because the corner piece is the superior piece. Truth, I'm just speaking the truth. They are soft, but yet also light and airy and dense. Is that even possible? With the perfect amount of pumpkin flavor. These are seriously so easy to make. Mmm. I may just eat these for dinner. Did I just eat an entire piece right in front of you? <laughs> yes, I did. No regrets. Mmm. Amazing. <laughs> these recipes are some of my family's absolute favorites. I am telling you, you cannot go wrong with any of them. Thanks for hanging out with me today and cooking with me in my kitchen today. I can't wait to see you in the next video.